on governance and policies to create an environment for accelerated recovery during crisis. Uh, for this panel, we are honored to have Raj Gilda, Ms. Sunita Sanghi, Vishnu Venugopalan, uh, and Yamini Iyer. The panel will aim to make specific actionable suggestions on how changes in governance and policy for the skilling ecosystem can enable accelerated recovery in times of crisis. And also briefly discuss the role of upskilling, reskilling, and alternate skilling in addition to fresh skilling. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the panelists to you very quickly. Uh, our first panelist is Raj Gilda, who is a banker turned social entrepreneur. He's a co founder for Lend a Hand, an NGO focused on providing vocational education in secondary schools in India. Our next panelist is Ms. Sunita Sanghi. Uh, she is an Indian economic services officer. Uh, she is currently posted as a senior advisor in the Ministry of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship Government of India. Uh, she's been actively involved in shaping the skill development and employment landscape in India for a decade, for over a decade. Our next panelist is Mr. Vishnu Go Venugopalan. Uh, Mr. Gopalan, Mr. Venugopalan is an IS officer and is currently serving as managing director of the Tamil Nadu Skill Development Corporation. Prior to this, he has served as sub-collector and sub-divisional magistrate with the government of Tamil Nadu and executive director with Chennai Metropolitan Water Supply and Sewage Board, and was an officer on special duty at Tuti Korin Port Trust, Ministry of Shipping. Uh, finally, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Yamini Iyer. Uh, in 2008, Yamini founded the Accountability Initiative at Center for Policy Research. Under her leadership, the Accountability Initiative has produced significant research in the areas of governance, state capacity, and social policy. She's a TED Fellow and founding member of the International Experts Panel of the Open Government Partnership. Yamini currently serves as the President and CEO of the Center for Policy Research. I welcome you, Yamini, and over to you for this engaging discussion that we are about to witness now. Yamini, you're on mute. Uh, yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. No, I'm not actually. Now you're not. Uh, yes, you're ah, on yeah. now. Okay, wonderful. Uh, just to say thank you very much uh, for giving me the privilege of hosting this very important discussion where I uh, actually have very little to offer and a lot to learn. Uh, so this is, uh, so, so I agree to do this entirely selfishly so that I could learn from our esteemed panelists um, on this very, very crucial challenge. Uh, to me, um, uh, you know, I think uh, the, the, the biggest challenge that the, that, that the, the, the issue of skilling is going to confront over the next uh, few years is that I think uh, post COVID uh, or even as we are uh, sort of dealing with um, the immediate uh, context of COVID, uh, the economy is beginning to look very, very different. Uh, the, uh, and uh, in terms of both, uh, what are the le new levers? So what, uh, what are the new levers of an economy that has to follow rules of social distancing or physical distancing in which in, uh, at least in some sectors, the gig economy starts and platform economy starts becoming a far greater, uh, having far greater value and a big source of innovation. Uh, and at the same time, uh, how do we uh, uh, how do we confront the uncertainties of the traditional sectors of the economy uh, that have to perhaps reorient themselves uh, to be able to both protect uh, then uh, the, protect their incomes and businesses at this current point in time, uh, but also be able to grow in the context of a great amount of uncertainty. Uh, so thinking about a regulatory and governance structure in that context, I think. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, pushes us uh, in, in, in new direction that makes it even more challenging, um, especially also uh, as uh, the education sector itself is going to have to go through a lot of innovation. I heard Dr. Kumar just before talking about uh, the importance of online education and the role that that's going to beginning to play uh, um, in, 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 uh, uh, in traditional forms of education, but also in skilling and capacity building. So how do we create a framework that merges these different um, 
uh, innovations that are emerging in the context of a very rapidly changing economy uh, and a lot of uncertainty in the economy uh, is, 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 is to me, I think, the big question that confronts us as we think about governance and policy in the context of skilling. Uh, so with that, I thought um, I, I would uh, request uh, Ms. Sanghi to perhaps uh, kick us off uh, just by offering her opening remarks uh, and uh, uh, we can take it forward from there. So over to you, Ms. Sanghi. Thank you. Thank you, Yamini. Thank you. And I must thank the organizers also for giving me this opportunity. I think Manish has actually set the stage for this particular session when he said that we need to change our strategy from productivity oriented approach to the human centric approach. And he has also made a mention about that we need to go back to the cluster based approach and we need to use the digital skilling to actually achieve the scale and improve the access and equity. Having said that, I think when we talk about the policy and the governance reforms, it's the policy reforms which are going to precede the governance, which are going to lead to the governance reforms. Now, in terms of the policy reforms, I think the Ministry of Skill Development has already taken a decision, and we are working to address such kind of disaster, which are an unknown disaster whose length and the time and the, up to which they are going to last, we are not aware. So what we have to begin with in the immediate what we have done is so that there is no break in the skill development. As a first step in the short term, immediately we ensure that all those who are actually doing the apprenticeship, they are paid their stipend. And we have also given our share from the government side to the enterprises so that they do not kick out the apprentices who are undergoing the apprenticeship training. Second important immediate measure that was taken, what Manish was also referring to, about that we have moved large number of skill training program on the online. In the skill ecosystem, we have both the short term and the long term training, uh, training program. As far as the short term training program is concerned, what Manish was referring to about the e-skilling portal that they have already moved and there are 300 courses which are available free, uh, online free of cost. Together with that on the long term training front, we have a Bhara skill portal. On the Bharat Skill Portal, we have already introduced the training program, the teaching processes, the learning the resources are available so that those students who are there in the ITI ecosystem, their training is also not disturbed and they continue to undergo a training. The third important thing that we are doing it is in terms of a regulatory framework. When I talk about the regulatory framework, we have a National Council of Vocational Education and Training, which has recently bring out a notification and which said that any training, because so far we had an approach where it's a face-to-face -face training. So online training was not known and which was not even recognized so far. So we have a notification which says that the anything which is going to be an online training which also be treated at par with the face-to-face -face training. So any policy reforms or any governance reform now will now has to look into move from the business as usual, away from the business as usual approach. Today, the entire skill value chain needs to be changed. When I talk about the skill value chain, in a face-to-face -face training, whether it's a short-term training or the long-term training, you actually involve face-to-face -face conversation with a prospective target group or trainee, and then you counsel them, you mobilize them, you deliver your talk, you do the assessment, and you have a rojgar mailers and other, so that they are placed. But with a situation like this, where there are challenges, where you have to comply the social distancing, it is very, very necessary to ensure that you have a very different kind of an environment where your counseling does not suffer, where your mobilization doesn't suffer, where the delivery of training doesn't suffer, and where people are actually able to get the training. Here comes the role of a digital training, what Manish has already explained in greater detail. Having said that, now, that was only for the skilling part. When we are doing the fresh skilling, because we all know that we are a young nation and we are trying to uh, actually address the issue and harness our demographic advantage. But then the bigger problem that has arisen now in the labor market is there were a large number of people who are working in the urban centers, tie one, tie two cities. Now they have gone back. Now, since they have gone back, there is a disturbance in the labor market. When the disturbance occurs in the labor market, wherever they go in the places of their original residence, they may or may not find the employment opportunities. And because they will not find an employment opportunities, the role of reskilling and upskilling becomes very, very important. 
since the role of reskill and upskilling becomes important, it also becomes very, very important that the state skill development mission, the district skill committees at the district level, because they are the one who will actually know who have come back. They have a database. So it becomes their now responsibility to map the skill of those who have come back and then ensure that these people are actually being able to reskill or upskill in those trades, in those job roles, which are actually relevant for the local economy. This becomes very, very important given the fact that our Honorable Prime Minister and his speech has also made, made focus on that we have to look inward in terms of self-reliant and we have to ensure that the local economy prosper. Because it may so happen that in a short run, not many of them are going to come back. So we cannot leave them on the roads. So there has to be something so that there is a continuity. So we have to look at skilling as a continuity plan because it is only skilling through the reskilling and upskilling that can provide them that. Besides reskilling and upskilling, there may be a large number of people what Manish was referring to about as a cluster-based approach. These people who are coming from the rural setting to the urban settings, they may be having certain skill sets which they are not using in the urban, but when they go back to their original places, they have those skill sets. If I really want them to be very, very productive and they are a part of a global value chain as well, I need to ensure that I do the recognition of prior learning. I assess their skill set and wherever there is a gap, I provide them that bridge training so that they are actually able to get the right kind of a training and they are able to participate in the economic activity. From the regulatory framework, the other change that we are contemplating is because we are, uh, most of the training program, wherever the government is providing the assistance, the uh, outgo is determined by what we know as a common norms. Now these common norms to today recognize only the face-to-face -face training, delivery training. There is no provision in these common norms to estimate the cost when it is online training. So we have already initiated from the ministry side to ensure that we modify our common norms to take on board all kinds of online training so that ultimately the training partner or the trainee does not suffer. Because see, when you move on to the online training, there are a lot of changes that the training partner has to bring about. He has to make ensure that the teacher is trained appropriately so that a teacher is able to actually train. He has also has to ensure that if there is a blended learning and if today there is 20 per student in a class, he may have to accommodate only 10 students. So he has to move in a shift system. He has to have a lot of curriculum, which is online curriculum. So for all this, he has to, the cost is to be built. That is why we are now looking in, modifying our common norms so that we are actually able to address the challenges such that we do not lose sight of scale. We do not lose sight of achieving the equity and excess. And this also gives an opportunity to improve our women labor force participation rate. Because today the women force labor force participation is very, very low. And I think the impact of this pandemic is there on women more. Because today when the men folk are returning back to the rural settings, more and more women will leave the jobs and leave those jobs for their men. So if we are able to reskill and upskill these women also in those employment opportunity, whether it is dairy, farming, whether it is pig rearing, whether it is honey kiwi making, we will be able to create the small, small entrepreneurs, maybe in a cluster, so that these women okay. are the market. These are my initial comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think this, this has uh, been really helpful in, in both setting the context and identifying the big transitions that we are uh, uh, confronting in the economy and how one needs to be thinking about the challenge of skilling in that context. Um, I, one of the very important takeaways I had uh, from what you were talking about was, uh, you know, both about being responsive to the changing labor market, uh, but also in the current context, focusing a lot 
lot more on the challenges that are going to confront the local economy. Uh, and mm -hmm. I suspect that, is, that there is going to be a renewed role, therefore, of um, the relationship of the state government and most importantly, actually, the local government, the Gram Panchayat, uh, in being able to strengthen and uh, build uh, a framework for uh, reskilling uh, and, and also creating links between uh, skilling and, and the labor market and the job market. Uh, Vishnu, could I bring you in on this from a state government perspective uh, and also as someone who uh, uh, has uh, the, your ear to the ground to give us a sense of how you are uh, beginning to understand these changes in the labor market um, and uh, what kind of skilling challenges that that presents um, and you know from your uh, fr uh, you know wh what is the new thinking that is evolving uh, both in terms of the local um, uh, bringing in the local governance institutions into the skilling uh, narrative as well as the kind of regulatory constraints or supports that you would need from the NSCC. So uh, very good morning to all the panelists. Uh, you put three government uh, officers in a panel. The third one is always finding it difficult to speak because the first two have already covered all the pretty much all the points. But nevertheless, uh, no, just but you're the one who has the ear to the ground now. So it's over to you to fact check everyone. <laughs> done, done. I'll try my best. <laughs> I'll try my best. So uh, let me put across three fundamental challenges. Okay, before I go into the district or, you know, the ground level, three fundamental challenges that we face from the state perspective or uh, from the state skill missions. The number one is um, doing skill development with quality at scale. Now, this is a very, very big challenge. You're not talking about numbers that are thousands or lakhs. You're talking about millions. I mean, every year, close to 10 lakh students write, uh, uh, you know, your 10 standard exam in uh, the SSLC exam in Tamil Nadu. Another 8.5 lakh students write their uh, 12 standard exam. Now, you're talking about really, really big numbers. And how do we challenge, how do we meet this twin challenge of scale with quality? Number one. Number two is, if you look at our education system, this was designed at a time when we knew with some confidence what is best for our kids. Today we don't. So in this yeah. whole discussion on you know, systems and um, uh, what is the skill development program, schemes, we really miss out what are the aspirations of the youth. So uh, Tamil Nadu, um, probably we're the first in the country to do a, a block level um, aspirational survey or skill gap study. I mean, there are a lot of skill gap studies being done across the country, even by NSDC way back in 2012. Uh, but we did a slightly, you know, drilling down to the block level. And we found out that there was a big mismatch between uh, the aspiration of the youth and, uh, and, 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 you know, the current uh, delivery uh, of whatever the skill development programs are. And we are trying in the course correction in that direction because um, they, that, that's clearly with the advent of digital learning and the, with the advent of knowledge, there's clearly an aspirational mismatch between what is being offered and um, what the students want. So we're missing out the critical aspect because we're talking about a population in the age group of 16 to 25 or 26. That's, that's, that's an age group you're talking about. Now, their aspirations are very, very different. Um, that's a challenge number two. The third challenge is, if you look at the half-life of knowledge, it's shrinking. I mean, it's highly radioactive. Uh, you don't, what is relevant today is not relevant six months down the lane. So what exactly do we skill them on? What is the content that we skill them on? Obviously, we do have the NSQ of the National skill qualification framework, which is, I would say, an achievement in itself. And all the state missions have um, moved to a standardized uh, delivery through the NSQ of the National Skill Qualification Framework. But uh, still, there is an industry or, you know, there, there is an employability and um, uh, the skill aspect that needs to be sorted out. If you look, if I may, you know, condense in a very simple form, education and employment are outcomes which are very, very complex. There are multiple um, uh, systems or multiple institutions at play. How do we get this right? Now, this is the context or the three fundamental challenges that we face uh, at the state, state level or even at the district level. So what are the interventions possible? Now, let's come to the actionable uh, part of what do the state governments or what are the district level initiatives can be done. Number one, we need to look at a cohort, an age cohort-wise intervention for skilling because uh, skilling at one shot, I mean, it doesn't really make sense. So when I say cohort, I'm just classifying, I'm going to classify into three different cohorts. The number one is uh, the uncertified workforce, which consists of definitely the school dropouts, the migrant laborers, because if you talk about, start talking about the industry, you miss out on what happened to school dropouts. There are a large number of them who fall, fall out from the education system. What do we do about them? The, 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 the basic NSQ of level one, two, three, et cetera, are more relevant for you know, school dropouts or who have not been able to even be part of the vocational education stream. What do we do about them? 
So uncertified workforce who have out from the formal system. Number two, are these formally certified? You don't know whether they're skilled or not, but they have a certificate. For example, 10th pass, a 12th pass, or an undergraduate degree, or post but they're certified. So by all standards, they're certified, whether they're skilled or not is a different question. And then we come to the third uh, important part, which is the niche skilling, which is for specific for industries, which is more relevant for probably more industrialized states like Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra, etc., where we need people trained in artificial intelligence, robotics, uh, IT, BFSI, you know, the advanced sectors. So we need to look at skill interventions in these three specific cohorts. And uh, in Tamil Nadu, let me, um, uh, let, let, me, uh, let me say that we have done, uh, we've been trying to look at uh, all three of these cohorts. But the first one is uncertified uh, workforce. Is definitely the recognition of prior learning is the method that we have followed, uh, which is what the, uh, you know, that, that's, that's the option that we have right now. Uh, but we need to come out with, uh, you know, a, a dynamic labor market information system. Uh, LMIS has been, this idea has been floating around for a while, but even now we do not have a functional LMIS uh, or labor market information system available because ultimately this depends purely on the labor market uh, at force at the district or regional level. Number two is um, uh, the assessment. Uh, when you say certification, let me, let me take the example of, a, let's say an urban club. Now, somebody needs to onboard into an urban club um, um, mode. Uh, it doesn't really matter whether you have a certificate or not, but the assessment is top class. Only if you're a skilled person, you actually get onboarded onto the urban club uh, platform. So which means the assessment is very strong and what you measure, definitely you can improve. So the assessment quality needs to be really top class to get into uh, any kind of uh, qualitative outcomes in terms of skill development. Uh, third part is yes, decentralized, which was uh, spoken, um, which was highlighted by uh, Sunita ma'am that uh, now we need to look at a decentralized cluster based approach. Um, we have the district skill committees in place, um, both on paper and in reality, because uh, many of the committees are on paper, but yeah, with fair amount of confidence, I can say that we do have meetings being conducted at regular intervals. Um, there is a flagship scheme by government of India called Sankal, under which um, they have been formed and we are also ensuring at the state level that uh, the district skill committees are actually activated and, and I am being very upfront on that. Um, so, so, I mean, a decentralized hyper local level of demand supply matching. I mean, with, with the post COVID scenario of decreased mobility, I mean, all, with all the constraints, we need to look at a hyper local, uh, demand supply aggregation where the premium may not be really on the wages part of it. Uh, but we need to look at, um, you know, other factors like, um, maybe not moving to urban agglomerations, but. Uh, having it at a regional level. Now, for this, I think the skill district skill committees are going to come in focus in the months or the years to come. Um, that's definitely the way forward. And I think um, uh, Tamil Nadu has done quite a bit of uh, work on that. And coming to the third part of niche skilling, we have uh, tried out a very uh, unique model, which is called uh, setting up of what is called the Apex Skill Development Centers, uh, which is on a 50-50 partnership model. Uh, where 50 percent, it's a JICA project. It's a Japanese international cooperation agency funded uh, under the flagship scheme of Tamil Nadu Investment Promotion Program, where a 50 percent equity will come from the private partner and 50 percent from the government. Uh, and this 50 percent from the private partner is not really training partners. They're actually big captive industries because ultimately, um, if you're looking at knee skilling, the industry needs to come forward and invest in training. Uh, so this model. Um, I mean, we were about to roll it out. Uh, it, it, it'll be in the form of a company, a Section 8 not-for-profit company. So this model uh, is something we are keenly looking forward to. And, uh, and, and we're looking at you know, increased partnership with MSMEs. Reskilling and upskilling for MSMEs is going to be of top priority uh, to generate jobs. Because if you look at the number of jobs, uh, they are not in the large industries. They are definitely in the MSME and the cottage in the tiny industries. Uh, for which upskilling and reskilling is important because um, every year you have technology competition happening in the MSME sector. So how well the uh, skilling systems adapt to this? Uh, I think these are some of the um, way forward uh, with sure. specific reference to Tamil Nadu and probably uh, the southern Thank states. you. Thank you. Th thank you so much, Vishnu. I think it's been uh, uh, really, really uh, appreciated your candid remarks, uh, mm. both in, uh, in terms of 
what are the kinds of uh, sort of mismatches of the education system, the aspirations, the uh, labor market, uh, the, the, uh, the, the sort of job market requirements, uh, as well as, uh, you know, it's very easy to talk about decentralized uh, cluster based approaches, but there are very big challenges of capacity and activation of these local committees. So I hope in the Q&A we'll get an opportunity to learn a little bit more in terms of what is it that you need to do to activate and strengthen uh, the, um, uh, the, these committees in other states and what lessons Tamil Nadu will have. Raj, uh, can I bring you in uh, both uh, to talk to us a little bit about how, uh, you know, the, your uh, understanding of the shifting trends in the job market uh, 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 and, and what that holds going forward. Uh, your, um, uh, also your sense of, you know, when we are talking about sort of go local, uh, what does that really mean from the perspective of both uh, the job seeker and uh, the labor market uh, and, and the demand for, for labor? Um, and, uh, you know, how does one leverage uh, the larger ecosystem of local governments, civil society organizations, and others um, in uh, contributing to a more robust skilling environment. Sure. Uh, thanks, Yamin. And first of all, very happy to be the only non-government panelist, you know, sort of here. And three of my favorite bureaucrats, Ms. Mrs. Sanghi, Mr. Venu Gupal, and Mr. Kumar, to be here. So it's definitely an honor to be, you know, part of this uh, panel. Uh, I think as Mr. Venugopal, you know, suggested, and I completely agree with uh, Mr. Manish Kumar's, uh, you know, comment uh, about that this is all going to be about learning to learn, you know, in that sense. The whole, I mean, it is it is going to be, it is, it is less about blockchain today and AI tomorrow and, you know, machine learning day after, right? Because that will keep changing. And you can't just keep chasing those things every day. But if I'm, if I'm able to equip the student or the young person who is in the market how to learn, uh, they will figure it out, you know, in that uh, sense. And the whole thing needs to happen from the school, because that is where, as Mr. Venugopal said, 10 lakh students are passing out from Tamil Nadu state itself, you know. So the whole exposure to world of work, how do we give it to ninth and 10th grade uh, students? And basically because of the dignity of labor, I think, you know, many times that is a fact which is not sort of you know, addressed more that you may need 1,000 plumbers, 1,000 welders, 1,000 drivers, but if nobody wants to become one, the demand supply gap doesn't really mean anything you know, in the whole mm -hmm. process. So how do you work with the schools, which are actually shaping the young minds? To, so I think the schools have a very huge role to play going forward in this uh, skill development scenario. I would say internships for all, you know, uh, places like Israel have draft into military. I think that we should have a compulsory internship. You cannot pass 10th grade or you can pass 12th grade unless you have done internship with sales. And it can be internship with even a shopkeeper next to you. It may not be into Reliance or Bajaj or, you know, any some big organized industry. It can be anywhere where you are learning to uh, learn. You should look at how each school and college can become a skill development center. You know, why we don't need to have a specialized you know, centers and other things too. There are so many, I mean, the schools and colleges are one where they have no mobilization issue in the first place. If you speak to anybody in the skill development industry right now, the biggest issue they face is about mobilization. Whereas we have lakhs and lakhs of students who are going to school and college every day or may go to online now. So democratizing the skill development in schools and uh, colleges is very important. You know, the NSK of norms, which we, uh, Mr. Vinukopal spoke about, needs to be customized for schools and colleges, right? In that sense. Now, NSDC approved auto training center may require 10 lakh rupees worth of, you know, auto training kit or auto training tools and equipment for one to become a two-wheeler auto mechanic, right? And that is necessary because, you know, they, they might be working for the big, uh, requiring an expert two-wheeler mechanic. But if you look at anybody on the street, the uh, auto mechanic whom you and me use, all the tools and equipment can be fit within one bag, right? Which will not cost you more than 10,000 rupees. Or even the beauty and wellness. You know, somebody beautician who comes to my home to work with my wife, she's coming with all her tools and equipment in a single bag. So why do I need a 5 lakh rupees worth of tools and equipment to conduct a beautician course? So I think those kind of democratization of uh, sort of, you know, uh, skill development, which are needed to take you to the masses, you know, uh, in that sense. I would say that uh, in, in terms of the uh, multi-skilling is another factor. You know, most of the efforts currently 
uh, which are there in the you know, skill development sector are sort of you know focused on the single sector becoming an expert narrow job roles and other things through so, and industries is working on broadening those job roles and as we focus more and more on micro and small enterprises how do we bring multi skilling because the typical enterprise that you are speaking about is not going to be able to hire out a welder and a fitter and a plumber and a carpenter it will be one person will need to know you know everything then only they can uh, sort of you know uh, look at it right talking about the now local institutions so i think civil societies have a great role to play in this now right whether it is private aided schools which are run by the trust and other things too or the civil society which has done a great job during the and not because i am from civil society sector i am saying this working with the, the sort of migrant population and acting as that last mile you know reaching the last mile to uh, fill up the gap and so viewing civil society as your partners and which we are very happy that we have received so much of outreach from the government to the civil society from this you know during the covid-19 disaster and i hope that continues going forward right in that sense and other thing which you can look at is like you know there is a lot of talk about online but at the same time there's so many students who don't have any online access at all so what are we going to do about them so things like skills at home now even within your kitchen or even within your garage you have number of instruments by which you can learn many skills you know it can be kitchen gardening it can be first care uh, first aid it can be food processing it can be need, you know uh, jewelry making it can be uh, you know uh, stitching whatever so i think coming up with programs like those which are able to use the local resources which are at home without much of a capital investment which is required which makes it prohibitive for it to go masses you know another thing so which will require uh, to mr sanghi's point regulatory reforms right in that sense because uh, to uh, sort of take it forward and one last point about the rural now that you know so many migrants are moving back i think gram panchayats will have a huge role to play you know they have a, i mean through ministry of and, and they have already done the decentralization and all that thing which we are talking about so how do we work with the gram panchayat there is still labor which have moved back to the village there are so many service needs which are there you talk about safe water safe drinking water you talk about you know uh, hygiene you talk about swachh bharat or you talk about odf other things too so how do we use this migrant labor which is moving back as part of the uh, gram panchayat you know skill force and connecting maybe this migrant labor who are skilled who are, who are, who are electrician in the uh, you know in the cities who are plumber in the cities and other thing too how do we connect them with the The schools which are located in the rural areas and they acting as a resource for the uh, sort of you know the school system, which is which uh, sort of so that all the students can get sort of you know access to it, right? So I would say that can be lucrative and shifting job trends. I think the job trends will keep shifting. We just need to make our people first of all accept dignity of labor, you know, whatever can be done about it, and secondly, learning to learn you know, in the dark. thank you thank you uh, for uh, giving that very important additional perspective uh, into uh, the the conversation and particularly the emphasis that you laid on the important role that civil society plays uh, in <clears throat> contributing and building the ecosystem i think we have about five or seven minutes sora if i'm right uh, and uh, we have quite a few questions so i had a i was hoping that we could do another round of q and a between us but time doesn't permit that so i'm going to try and merge a few of the questions uh, together there's quite a few questions um one i think fairly uh, critical one that sort of picks up uh, 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 which i think would be interesting to learn from the panelists is on the question of female workforce participation uh and uh, what are covid implications uh, we, we you know covid hit at a time when we were seeing a fairly dramatic drop in female labor force participation in india relative uh, to other countries at similar trajectories in their growth um uh, what would be the implications of covid and how does one think of skilling in that context um and i'll ask i i i'll also just pose a second question uh that has come up uh or in terms of uh, the overarching the role of the overarching regulator and cbet uh, how do palanis see its role in strengthening skilling in the evolving covid situation um, and i'd like you all to maybe use that as a segue to reflect a little bit more on the key regulatory shifts uh, that are going to be needed going forward so maybe we can take these two and if time permits uh, or, or rather if sora permits we can do one more round can i do the first yes, please yeah as i said in my initial comments Uh, because 
uh, in the labor market, the female participation is going down. But since the focus is now going to be on MSME and the local, if the focus is going to be on local and MSME, the role of the self-help group becomes very, very important when it comes to local. And most mm -hmm. self-help groups are by the women. So if that is by the women, I think we need to tie up with the self-help group through the DDU GKY, and that's what the Ministry of Skill Development is already thinking of. Uh, and we have already initiated our talks to converge our program with the DDU GKY so that we can ride on their platform as well because they have a, be a better reach through the SGF, SHGs, so that we are able to actually reskill and upskill the women in the job roles which matters for the local economy. When I say for the local economy, maybe small food processing unit making papas or achar or maybe doing some small odd jobs which they were doing themselves earlier, but now with more assistance under the stimulus packages that have been announced, these women can be incentivized to take the loan and set up maybe as an SHG, a small enterprise, and then enter the labor market and start building their capacities to produce more. And this can only be possible if we are able to skill and reskill them again and again so that they can meet the requirement of a national labor market, national market, national market, because that is very, very important. On the second point, on overarching NCVT and how do we strengthen the regulation? As I said earlier that already NCVT has issued an order wherein it has said that the online training would be treated at par with the face-to-face -face training that we have been doing so far. Now we are also working on new assessment and certification because assessment, awarding body and certification is part of the NCVT mandate. So we have already started working on the guidelines which will govern the online assessment and certification also. So that is what we are doing to address the post-COVID situation. Thank you. Uh, Raj or Vishnu, would yeah, you want to uh, If I can come in, I think the, about the female workforce participation, it has to beginning from ma making beginning from the home. You know, it is most of the time the parents who are deciding what the girl child will do and kind of orientation they get and other things too. So the more we are able to break the gender barriers in terms of the girls are not going to do only beautician course or the boys are not going to do only welding course and both can do each other's job, you know, very excellently given an opportunity. So things like those ex and internships, which I earlier spoke about, which were carried out in Maharashtra and Delhi as well, where the girls have become CNC machine operators, electricians, fabricators, and other things. So that has happened because the internship allowed those parents also to view their girl child doing many more of a non-traditional job role now. And, and we have seen that more than 80% of the parents are now willing to let their daughters do the job roles which are not in the within sort of you know purview of a traditional uh, sort of female uh, domain, right? So I, I would think that those kind of uh, uh, those kind of things may not bring results immediately, but if you want to see the long-term shift, say four or five years down the line, those things will be quite necessary too. Great, great. Uh, Vishnu, the last word. I think we are hitting the. Uh, end of our uh, session, so I'll give you the la last word. Who are you asking? Who are you asking? Yeah. Asking? yeah. So, uh, <laughs> take, I'll not take long, just a um, couple of sentences, that's it. Uh, well, um, coming to the female participation, uh, you know, it's very clear that a job in a conventional sense is not the solution because you're looking at uh, a localized opportunity. I go back to Sunita Ma'am's point that uh, livelihoods, we have had multiple, India has multiple opportunities with you know, the SGSY, then came the NLM, the livelihood missions and uh, the SG formations. But access to capital is one critical aspect which needs to be linked with, uh, you know, uh, along with the skill development ecosystem, which is currently I feel is missing. There is no uh, organic linkage between access to capital and, uh, you know, at the end of skilling programs, you expect to get a job. Now, the job in a conventional sense is no more going to be there, it's very clear. Uh, especially in a rural economy. So we need to look at micro entrepreneurship, uh, look at opportunities at a localized, hyper local level is what I think is a solution uh, that we need to look forward to. Um, yeah, I think somebody is putting time, time, time. So I think I need to stop <laughs> Well, 
<laughs> Thank you very much uh, to all the panelists. This has, uh, as expected, been a very, very important and insightful conversation. And uh, if only we had more time, because there's so many critical issues that have emerged. But to me, I think the biggest takeaway is uh, that the need for reframing our approach to skilling in the context of uh, changing labor, uh, uh, the, the changing labor market, and building uh, and responding to the very hyper local demand for uh, skills that is going to emerge going forward. Uh, so go local also means thinking about strengthening our local governance institutions, which I think will have lots of very positive externalities on many other aspects of governance too. Uh, so, so this is a great opportunity to empower uh, uh, our third tier and our district administration in ways that will, I think, be for the good of India's federal structure. So thank you very much uh, to all the panelists mm -hmm. and over to you, Saurabh. Thanks Thank so you. much, Yamini. Thank that was a very, very Thank nice thing. That was a very, very insightful uh, panel. And thanks to all the panelists. A lot of uh, 